Good morning, chemistry students. Here are, again, a continuation of your Chapter 5 notes. This is our Day 3 of notes, if you will. We are going to be covering the portion of your outline that starts with 5.2, Structure of the Nuclear Atom, and we're going to go through the end of mass number. So again, at this time, you should be getting your outline out and in front of you. So remember that we have been talking kind of about the history of how the um, atom was discovered and Dalton's atomic theory of thoughts of what an atom was. And we talked about how protons came to be known and electrons came to be discovered and neutrons. So now that we've kind of finished the kind of history, if you will, lesson, now we're going to kind of switch to talking about you know, how these parts that we've talked about, how they've been discovered, how they're organized inside an atom. My assumption is that most of you have probably learned this at some point in the past, but it might be a little, might have some cobwebs on it, okay? And so the purpose of this is just to make sure everyone's um, on the same page, moving forward, and kind of remembers everything well. So we're going to start by talking about uh, electrons. And again, we're going to kind of start by talking about Dalton's atomic theory. And the fact that Dalton's atomic theory is accepted today, accepted today, except that atoms are divisible. Again, because now we know that inside of an atom, we have protons, electrons, and neutrons. Again, I do feel like this is an area where we can kind of excuse John Dalton, because remember, even today, we still can't see an atom. So to think that in the mid-1800s, he was talking about and envisioning what an atom was like, and he couldn't see it, we can imagine how he would think that it wouldn't be possible to break it down into smaller pieces. So we do know today, okay, that um, atoms can be broken down into smaller fundamental particles. called subatomic particles. Now, again, this is kind of a good opportunity for a little bit of an English history, right? In this word subatomic, atomic refers to an atom. Sub is a prefix, and a submarine, right, is within marine, which is water. So subatomic just means within an atom. So these are particles that are called subatomic particles because they are within the atom. And we know that there are three kinds. The electrons, the protons, and the neutrons. And we're going to talk about all three of those particles today. So we're going to start by talking about the electrons. The electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles. So again, all we're saying here is that they have a negative charge and they're found within that atom. Um, the abbreviation that we use for electrons, and this will be a handy abbreviation as you take notes because it'll save you a bit of time, is we use a lowercase e with a minus sign. Why do you think we choose that? 
right, lowercase e standing for the word electron, and minus because it has a negative charge. Now, kind of reminding you of the kind of history that we've talked about the past couple days, the two scientists that typically are given credit for having discovered the electron are Thompson and Millikan. I'm sorry, I see that this paused, and I'm not quite sure when it paused. So just really quickly kind of going back, okay? Um, again, Dalton's atomic theory was accepted, um, except the divisible part. Electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles. Again, subatomic meaning um, within the atom. The abbreviation is the E with the minus sign, and Thompson and Millikan are um, credited with having discovered the electrons. Protons are positively charged subatomic particles. Um, they're believed to be made of smaller subnuclear particles, and subnuclear means within the nucleus of the atom, and those particles are called quarks. Our abbreviation is P with a plus sign, and Goldstein is typically given the credit for having discovered it. So, um, again, then talking about our neutrons, okay, so neutrons are subatomic particles with no charge but with mass nearly equal to that of the proton. So what we're just saying here is neutrons don't have a charge. And if I were to hold a proton and a neutron in my hand, they would feel like they had the same mass. Again, neutrons also are believed to be made of smaller subnuclear particles and again those are called quarks the abbreviation that we use for neutrons is N with a zero again why do you think that is N for neutron, zero for the fact that it doesn't have a charge. And the scientists typically given credit for having discovered the neutron is Chadwick. So again, you knew this. You've probably learned before that we have protons, electrons, and neutrons inside of atoms. So a nice little chart here that sort of um, summarizes all of this information, right? We have the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And so our symbol for the electron is that E with the minus. Its relative electric charge is negative 1. Its relative mass is 1 over 1,840. Remember, we've seen that before. One of the scientists we talked about discovered that. And again, that idea it, behind that is, is that it would take 1,840 electrons to equal the mass of one proton. Now, the actual mass of an electron, right, an electron is tiny, tiny. So the actual mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28th power in grams, okay? So an electron is tiny, tiny. For protons, again, we talked about this fact that the symbol is the lowercase p with a plus sign. It has a charge of plus 1. Its mass, its relative mass is 1, and the mass, the actual mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. For our neutron, our symbol is an N with a 0. Its relative electric charge is 0. 
and its relative mass is 1, which basically is saying that if I held a proton in one hand and a neutron in the other hand, they would feel like they have the same amount of mass. And in fact, we actually see that true also of their actual mass. The actual mass of a neutron is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So we know that we talked about the fact that Rutherford had discovered the nucleus of an atom. So remember that our nucleus is our tiny central core of the atom. And so by tiny what we mean is it's really small compared to the overall size of the atom. And central just means that it's in the middle of the atom. The nucleus is made of the protons and the neutrons. So both the protons and neutrons are found inside the nucleus. And so again, a little bit more about um, how this um, nucleus and this atom are organized. The protons and the neutrons are located in the positively charged nucleus. Now for just take a moment here, why is it that the nucleus is positively charged? What makes the nucleus positively charged? Well, what particles do we have in it? We have protons and, our, and neutrons. Remember, neutrons don't have a charge, but protons are positively charged. So the nucleus is positively charged because it contains the positively charged protons. So we know um, our protons and neutrons are located in our positively charged nucleus. The electrons are distributed around the nucleus. and occupy almost all the volume of the atom. Um, an analogy that I've heard before is thinking about a baseball stadium, okay? Um, the nucleus of the atom would be like the baseball, baseball size in the middle of the baseball stadium and then the stadium itself, that would be the space that the electrons occupy. And lastly, we want to talk about and remind you about who discovered the nucleus. Remember, it was Ernest Rutherford with his gold foil experiment who discovered the nucleus of the atom. Remember, he was testing that plum pudding model that J.J. Thompson had for the atom. So now that we understand the parts of an atom, how do we tell one atom from another? So what makes an atom hydrogen and not oxygen or iron or fluorine? Okay, so um, for atomic number, we're going to talk about the fact that we're going to kind of compare it to dogs. Dogs differ in many ways okay for example color size ear shape length of hair so what i mean by that is to kind of think about this right when you're walking down the street and you see an animal, you know if that animal is a dog because all dogs have certain characteristics that make them a dog, right? They have four legs, they have some sort of tail, have some sort of ears, they kind of have a muzzle or mouth, okay? You can tell a dog from a cat, because they have different kinds of characteristic, right? Dogs bark. A cat is going to meow. So 
just like dogs have certain characteristics that make them dogs, there are certain things about an atom that all atoms have in common, even though they're a little different from each other. Just like there are certain characteristics that all dogs have in common, even though they're a little bit different from each other. Okay, so um, again, just as there are many types of dogs, atoms come in different varieties. as well. But no matter what, again, one of the things that all atoms have in common is that atoms are made of protons, electrons, and neutrons. And one thing again that all atoms have in common is that those electrons surround the nucleus and the protons and neutrons make up the nucleus. So, what is atomic number? Atomic number is defined as the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom of that element. So my kind of question for you, can atomic number be a decimal? Or a fraction? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? The atomic number cannot be a decimal because it's the number of protons. And we can't break protons down into smaller pieces. We think they might be made of quarks, but we can't break them down into their quarks. So you either have a whole proton or you don't have a proton. You can't have a half or a quarter or three quarters of a proton. So can the atomic number be a decimal or a fraction? No. All right, atomic number is what makes elements different. So elements are different because they contain different numbers of protons. So what we're saying here, what I'm saying is, what makes an atom of hydrogen hydrogen is the fact that it has one proton in its nucleus. What makes an atom of oxygen oxygen is the fact that it has eight protons in its nucleus. Every atom or every element on the periodic table has a different number of protons in its nucleus. That's what makes one atom different from another. Now, I'm going to use the term atom and element sometimes interchangeably, and so I want to kind of clear that up. It's the same thing. The difference being, atom allows me to talk about just one single atom by itself. By definition, when I talk about an element, I'm talking about a whole bunch of atoms already together. 
Okay, so at element is kind of plural. It means a whole bunch of atoms. But again, sometimes your textbook, sometimes I'm going to use atom and element interchangeably. So what that means is that the atomic number identifies an element. So it would be helpful if you would pull out a periodic table or take a look at one somewhere. There is a periodic table, by the way, on the inside back cover of your textbook. So in an atom, you have probably learned before that the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. This is because atoms are electrically neutral. So the number of um, electrons with a negative charge is equal to the number of protons with a positive charge. Now, atomic number is found on all periodic tables. So let's imagine that you're looking at periodic table and most periodic tables have a key on them, but let's say you can't see the key, okay? How will you know which number is the atomic number? How do you identify it? Well, remember, it has to be a whole number. So it is a whole number. And remember, it's different for every element on the periodic table. And if you remember back to when we talked about Mosley, we talked about the fact that our periodic table is actually organized by atomic number. So the elements on the periodic table are in order by atomic number. So if we take a look at an example, if you look for hydrogen, hydrogen has one proton. Therefore, its atomic number is 1. So our atomic number always tells us how many protons there are in the atom. And because an atom doesn't have a charge, hydrogen also would have one electron. So for these three elements, using your periodic table. See if you can fill in the atomic number, the number of protons, and the number of electrons. So you have had a bit of time, and if you need a bit more time, you can always pause the recording. Um, you've had a bit of time, so now you're gonna use your periodic table, and you're gonna look up the atomic number. And again, it's in different places on different periodic tables, but it's a whole number. So when you look for boron, you should find that the atomic number is number five, which means that boron has five protons because the atomic number and number of protons are equal to one another. And boron also has five electrons because it's a neutral atom and protons and electrons are equal to each other. So for nitrogen, nitrogen's atomic number is seven, which means it has seven protons and seven electrons. And finally, neon's atomic number is 10, which means it has 10 protons and 10 electrons. So now that we've talked about atomic number, we're gonna talk about mass number. Now, mass number is a little bit different. The definition of mass number is it is the total number of protons and neutrons in an atom. 
So total means that you're going to have to do some math to figure it out because you're going to have to add together the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Now, when we talk about mass number, um, most of the mass of an atom is concentrated in its nucleus because the protons and the nutri neutrons are both in the nucleus of the atom and so pretty much all of the mass of an atom is concentrated in its nucleus and it depends on the number of protons and neutrons. So I want you to think for a minute, why isn't the mass of an atom, and therefore the mass number of an atom, why does it not include the electrons? So remember, when we talked about electrons back here in this, in our chart, <laughs> right, we said that an electron was tiny compared to protons and neutrons. It takes 1,840 electrons to equal just one proton. So why not the electrons? Because by comparison, an electron is so tiny that it doesn't really count at all, okay? So for example, it'd be sort of like if you were um, using one of those big scales to take the, to measure the mass of a semi-truck. If you add a shoe to that, that, that scale, it's not going to really change the reading on the scale because that shoe is so tiny in terms of mass compared to the semi-truck. An electron is the same way. By comparison, its mass is so tiny that it basically doesn't count. So make sure you have a little note about that in your notes. So to kind of look at an example, okay, helium has an atomic number of two, so it has two protons. Helium also has two neutrons. Therefore, and this is the symbol you might have used in math class for therefore, therefore the mass number of helium is four. If we look at carbon, carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Therefore, it has a mass number of 12, 6 plus 6. So mass number is always the total number of protons and neutrons. So you were able to figure out those mass numbers because I told you the number of neutrons. If you know the atomic number and the mass number, you can determine um, the atom's composition. Meaning you can figure out how many protons the atom has, how many electrons the atom has, how many neutrons the atom has. To figure out okay, the number of neutrons, you're going to take your mass number and, sorry, mass number and subtract your atomic number. And mass numbers are not on the periodic table. Okay, so you do not find mass numbers on the periodic table because, again, there's a number of protons and neutrons. That would be a whole number, and there's not a second whole number on the periodic table for every element. Okay, so um, 
if we kind of look real quick at an example of that, and I'll kind of do this example in red, okay? So our example of that is we have fluorine with a mass number of 19. So how many protons does it have? How many electrons does it have? How many neutrons? Well, to figure out the number of protons, I'm going to look up fluorine on the periodic table and find its atomic number, and it has atomic number 9, so it has 9 protons. Because it's a neutral atom, it also has 9 electrons, because the number of protons and number of electrons have to be equal. To figure out the number of neutrons, I'm going to take this mass number of 19 and subtract my atomic number, which was 9, and so I have 10 neutrons. So because mass numbers are not on the periodic table, somehow that information has to be given to you. So these are kind of three ways that that information can be given to you. When you see an element written this first way, this top number is the mass number, and this bottom number is the atomic number. Now, it's possible that you could not be given the atomic number. But that's not a big deal because as long as you know the element symbol, you can find its atomic number on the periodic table. So when you're given um, it the second way, again, this number here is the mass number. And this is the element's name. So because I have the name, again, I can use my periodic table to find my atomic number. This last one, again, this 197 is still the mass number, and again, AU is the symbol for gold. So these are different ways that you can be given this information. So let's take a look at an example. For these examples, I would like you to tell me the number of protons, the number of electrons, and the number of neutrons. So the first one, Here is the second one, and here is the third one. Okay. So for these, figure out the numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons. If you need a little bit more time, again, remember, you can pause this video and give yourself a little bit more time. You're going to use your periodic table. So. When we're given this information this first way, as in this first example, remember this number down here is my atomic number, and the atomic number is the number of protons. So I have four protons. Because this is a neutral atom and doesn't have a charge, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. So if I have four protons, I also have four electrons. Finally, to figure out the number of neutrons, I'm going to take my mass number and subtract my atomic number. So 9 minus 4 gives me 5 neutrons. Now, in the second example, neon, I didn't give you the atomic number. But again, that's not a problem because you use your periodic table, you find neon on your periodic table, and you find out its atomic number. When you do that, you find the atomic number of neon is 10. Again, because the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, neon has 10 electrons. Now, to figure out the number of neutrons, I'm going to do its mass number, which is 20, and subtract its number of protons, which is 10, which gives me also 10 neutrons. This last example of sodium, okay? Um, for sodium, again, I didn't give the atomic number, but again, you use your periodic table, you look up the symbol Na, and you find that its atomic number is 11. So it also has 11 electrons because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. To figure out the number of neutrons, I'm going to do 23, our, again, our mass number, subtracting our number of protons, which gives us 12 neutrons total. So that brings us to a nice spot to stop. Your homework assignment is on page 112 in your textbook, questions 4 and 5. You need to answer those questions. Now, 
this page here I have set up like your homework would look like. And that doesn't matter whether you're going to, you have kind of two choices. You can type your homework using Google Docs. Or you can handwrite out your homework if you'd like. Okay. Now, any which way you do your homework, all homework will be turned in through Google Classroom. So you will need to look under the Classwork tab and find homework number one. And once you find homework number one, you're going to click on it and it's going to give you the opportunity to attach a file. So if you have typed it in Google Docs, you're just going to attach that Google Doc. If you have handwritten it out, you will then have to take a picture of your assignment. You'll need to upload the photo to Google Docs or to um, Google your Google Drive, sorry. And then once it's in your Google Drive, you can find it just the same way you would find your Google Doc to attach it. When you're titling, again, like I said, I want the top of your papers to look like this. So somewhere at the top of your paper, whether you type it or handwrite it, I want your first and last name, what period you're in, and the date. Somewhere at the top of your paper, I want the assignment. I number all the homework assignments to make it a little bit easier to keep track of them. But I want more than the homework number. I want what the assignment actually is. If you're going to use Google Docs, I would prefer that you title your um, assignment like its name is your last name and then the homework number. So if I was doing this homework, I would call it Krem Schreiter homework number one. Okay? So any which way, you won't be giving me any paper for your homework assignments. Now, before you turn in your homework, you do need to check your homework. At 7 p.m., the day your assignment is assigned, a key will become available in Google Classroom. It's down underneath towards the bottom of your classwork page or tab um, called Homework Keys. You'll look there. The, um, the, a picture, probably a picture of the uh, key will be there. You're going to kind of check your work before you submit your assignment. So, you do have some homework to do this evening. It shouldn't take you too long. Um, have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow.